Λοιπόν, καλησπέρα σα. Ε, με έτο αποφύτηση το 1970 από τη σχολή αυτή, το να βρίσκεσαι πίσω στη σχολή τη χρονιά που γιορτάζει τα 100 τη χρόνια είναι σίγουρα ένα μακρύ ταξίδι, Χρήστο, και τύχη καλή. Ε, καλωσορίζουμε τον Χρήστο Γεωργάκη, σημερινό μιλητή μα, προσκεκριμένο μα, στη σχολή, με ιδιαίτερη χαρά και τιμή. Και ως απόφετος του 1970, νομίζω ότι συμβολικότητα και ουσιαστικότητα χαρακτηρίζει την επαιτειακή περίοδο της σχολής α, αυτού του καιρού. Ο Γρήσο Γεωργάκης α, είναι καθηγητής στο Chemical and Biological Engineering Department στο Tufts University, ε, όπου επίσης είναι ο Gordon Senior Faculty Fellow στο, σε Systems Engineering. Το δίπλωμά του, όπως είπα, το πήρε το 1970, Εν συνεχεία πήρε το μάστερ στο University of Illinois το 1972. Μετά από το University of Minnesota πήρε το διδακτορικό το 1975. Επιτρέψτε μου να δηλώσω ε, διπλά χαρούμενος, διότι μοιράζομαι με τον Χρήστο ε, ακαδημαϊκή πατρίδα εις διπλούν, μία τρεμαϊκή και άλλη τη Μινεσότα. Είναι από εκείνη τη γενιά ο Χρήστος ε, που άνοιξε και έδειξε τον δρόμο για την Αμερική. Και από αυτούς που οικοδόμησαν τη φήμη της σχολής στο εξωτερικό και ειδικά στη Βόρεια Αμερική και στήριξαν και υπήρξαν, υπήρξαν υποδείγματα για τους νεότερους στην αντίστοιχη διαδρομή. Ε, μετά λοιπόν το διδακτορικό του ο Χρήστος Γεωργάκης από το 1975 μέχρι το 1983 ήταν καθηγητής στο Department of Chemical Engineering στο MIT. Είναι πληθωρική η ακαδημαϊκή του διαδρομή, εμβολίμως με την περίοδο εκείνη, το 1980 μέχρι το 1983, ήταν καθηγητής, έτσι το γράφει, of measurement and control στο Αριστοτέλειο Πανεπιστήμιο Θεσσαλονίκη, στο Τμήμα Χημικών Μηχανικών και ήταν από εκείνους οι οποίοι ίδρυσαν και ξεκίνησαν το Ινστιτούτο ε, Μηχανικής Διεργασιών στο, στο Θεσσαλονίκη. Το 1983 άφησε τη Θεσσαλονίκη και επέστρεψε στην Αμερική, στο Lehigh University, όπου εκείδεσε το Chemical Process Modeling and Control Research Center. Εκεί παρέμεινε μέχρι το 2004 και τότε μετακινήθηκε στο Tufts University, όπου και παραμένει μέχρι σήμερα. Από τις διακρίσεις και τα πεπραγμένα του Χρήστου Γεωργάκη, έχω επιλέξει να αναφερθώ σε δύο. Είδα στο βιογραφικό του ότι το πρώτο βραβείο χρονολογικά που αναφέρει είναι το δεύτερο βραβείο στον διαγωνισμό της Ελληνικής Μαθηματικής Εταιρείας 1965. Και από τα πιο πρόσφατα βραβεία του είναι αυτό το Computing Award of the Computing and Systems Technology, το CAS Division, δηλαδή του American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Είναι fellow ε, του American Institute of Chemical Engineers του American Association for the Advancement of Science, του International Federation of Automatic Control, όπου από το 2002 μέχρι το 2003 ήταν και πρόεδρος του. Ε, έξι χρόνια πριν ξεκίνησε μια νέα σειρά συνεδρίων, τα οποία ονομάζονται Future Innovation in Process Systems Engineering και το τέταρτο πρόκειται να γίνει του χρόνου τον Ιούνιο στη Καλλιτική στην Ελλάδα. Ε, πέραν όλων αυτών, με τον Χρήστο Γεωργάκη ε, ξανα ε, ζωντάνεψαν οι σχέσεις της σχολής πριν από περίπου δύο χρόνια, όταν ε, αυτός μαζί με τον Γρηγόρη τον Στεφανόπουλο μας ε, τσίγκλησαν πολύ έντονα να συμμετέχουμε σε διεθνή δρόμενα, ε, συγκεκριμένα στο Chemical Competition, το οποίο γίνεται πάντα δορυφορικά με το Annual Conference του American Institute of Chemical Engineers. Η εμπειρία ήταν εξαιρετική. Τώρα βλέπω ότι βλέπουμε από κάποια απόσταση ήταν υπέροχη, θα έλεγα, κυρίω για του φοιτητέ, την ομάδα η οποία όχι μόνο αυτή που συμμετείχε στο διαγωνισμό, γιατί προκρίθηκε από την εσωτερική διαδικασία, αλλά για όλου του φοιτητέ ήταν αρκετοί. Όλοι του σχεδόν τριτοετή, νομίζω, ήταν η πλειοψηφία τότε. Τώρα έχουν πει στο πέμπτο έτο των σπουδών, ε, οι οποίοι συμμετείχαν σε αυτή την, ε, τη διαδικασία. Ε, Χρήστο, ευχαριστούμε και για αυτό και για το ότι σήμερα εδώ και αντιμπορούμε να σε ακούσουμε. Χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ. Προφανώς μεγάλη μου τιμή και καλά να είμαι εδώ. Η τελευταία μου επίσκεψη 
Sa tad aktivija je tam 2000, neko je sveki sin, da je Tariks, da je Oktovotan i kam ajaču za kad je spisus smjeruje od Konofanovi. Konofanovi se školji i to te dengi tam dolgi, da je kato s tim... Patisivan. Možda pri Patisivan, ki je i prejuhitu Egiju podelimo na Puebena i tam te ljude politija, po te ima dovolta. Po Andrejas muzici na podiologije je ta tote kronja, po panu si ten ta kronja kvitar je predika po tore, če je prosto kalitori, prosto dirotori. Firmame je karakteristika, odgodam protoitame, to je ksinta pende sam protofiti, ima se sen prova ta polola, vikame se niso, ker ven hipi kapljus, da ima spi puna pamet, ki psahnoma se. Potem, Matimata Pisikis, ki je šel pisalo za Matimata, ima se svelo na oljime gravate, ki je za karki, to je ta nekaj nekaj in zelj, ki je za to kratelju, si kono masterorski. Ki je nekaj tipu dvenjih kam eksamine, ki je nekaj olokiro poetus, ki ne menem, ki je nekaj provo do centerju, ali tam ta potrebno, da prema to malo. Paro ljigo na ta parati so ti grodi hlonja, ker ti in mora sem polita matematika, ki jo tam s tim analitiki himija in se ali se te skana na jove, ki te treba niki je vizda tu ena sin epsilon, ki le imamo ti ne ena, ne ve na to je tam ena to. Nje aksija grami, nje aksija grami, na stiklu sin epsiklu, za eni ne aksija grami plus sin imijo epsilon. Tedika, jedan period, ki je vjetro logo eni, ne? A period logo je da neksis kakja mežitrija s nami i kimija, etede, ki je mlikli, geogaki, sa spargo vso oloto kronu, ki nisem se teljo spiramatisti. Ti mu lejo. Na ti delaj na dvrepsu do kalakeri so ergastirijo, da je kato ve ne edine, ali pa revi na sinjerdiki, en sinjerdiki, s tem kimikaliki, s tem kimikaliki, Med tem teorijo, ki pa poručam, če smo prišli, ki na gatimu, ki ti ne presimo sa matematika, se pola tema, da smo ki zelo ljudi. Ker če te dika egne. Piramata je hokaj meri, kaj so pravi pon, ta so spod, ki ga je najdo, ali zdaj se vrlo to ne v tomu piramatisti. To teliko, to teliko siberazma ine, a v to pripa, ki sa verjam, Kante karti, ku na ine na minimi vlja, ali na ne hobi. Zdaj ne hobi lepši. Ta televizija sada da hodim. A plus, epek se skisi do hobi, kada kapi troku, kapi je zrcljivo se na zakon na to. To mojno bi mojno bi fora in od jedina pokanjika niz je autor. To kanj je dolika, da kaj se kati vela, ki kada se ovekira. Ti ne pohi tote profanosti, ta ni je pohi po alak se do tmima arketasi madika, i ta ne si I tam imajo ta vrati ki periodo za pod tim nepohitom tehnologijom, s tim nepohitim modernostim kitnikami kisi, tam je pohit, ko to ih je bil Saravakos, po Kuvučos, po Maragozis, po Sandri, ki oni jihan rosim, ja te lijos, ja poetiki pnoj, ja moderna pnojisti kimikimi, ja nekaj. Potem figame emis, ki je Merikija, jo, 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 se pa no komo scenas, ki je vikana v Joali, sto Kanada. I tam poljivje školo na vlume, pa na vistimije, kot nama zena ne bo skupije. A poljivje školo se pa no komo skje voj, kam je kani sredeka pa na vistimije v Katenas, mali se da ikame se lom poris. Mono stoj maj tike, sto mak master, kam ne ma zi. Skedan, oni ma sila ne vki iz. Etihe na njime, ki je bio dektisto Mahmasteru, se boji na dektos, ki je to panaksimije tu iz Inojs, ja to napusta to logo, ti kap, jo se kihe, moli ste dios, in na nova ti karambelac. Kati ki tis, in pa se vam nič je vigrozi. Efta sa sto iz Inojs, mali sta presko pa do mene, ki je toto sto iz Inojs, si jihame eksetasis, kata ta kada taktirijes, ja nam as tu ne pupe riku, ti matma na paru, ma njihamo rizmene se ljepšis.
Και εκείνο που πάντα θυμάμαι και έχει μαρκάρει την τιμή μου ήταν όταν πήρα την εξέταση για φαινόμενα μεταφορά. Έτρεμα ότι δεν θα πήγαινα και τόσο καλά γιατί δεν είχα μάθει το βιβλίο του Bird, Stewart and Lightfoot, το οποίο νομίζω ότι ξέρετε. Όχι. Ξέρω. Από την πρώτη με την τελευταία σελίδα. Παρά τα αυτά πήρα δέκα και ο άνθρωπο που τότε ήταν ο εξεταστή, ο Τζον Κουίν, που τελικά πήγε στην Πενσιλβάνια, έγινε φίλο μου και, και ο οικογενειακό φίλο για πολλά χρόνια. Αποφάσισα να ξαναπάρω το μάθημα των Unit Operations, γιατί θεωρούσα πω με τον Βεριγιάννη δεν τα είχαμε μάθει ποσοτικά. Και μου λέγανε, γιατί το κάνει αυτό, αυτό είναι αποκτυχιακό μάθημα. Τέλο πάντων. Uh, όλα πήγαν μια χαρά και προφανώς uh, άνοιξαν κι άλλοι δρόμοι και στην περίπτωση σήμερα έχουμε το ρητό ότι κανένα τμήμα κοινωνικής μηχανικής στην Αμερική δεν αξίζει το κόπο να είναι καλό αν δεν έχει τουλάχιστον δύο καθηγητές Έλληνες. Εμείς στο ΤΑΣ έχουμε 12 uh, μέλη δε, των οποίων η κρίση είμαστε Έλληνες. Και νομίζω και οι τρει από το Πολυτεχνείο, δεν είμαι σίγουρο, μάλλον όχι ο τρίτο. σω δεν είναι το Πολυτεχνείο, είναι η Θεσσαλονίκη, αλλά και τα νεότερα. Η, δεύτε, η δεύτερη καθηγήτρια είναι η κυρία Πιτζάνη Στεφανοπούλου, σύζυγο του Γρηγόρη του Στεφανοπούλου, που δεν ξέρω. Αρκετά. Μια χαρά. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Α, να σα μιλήσω λοιπόν για ένα θέμα που είναι του ενδιαφέροντος μου ερευνητικά. Να ξεκινήσω κάπως πιο γενικά με ένα θέμα που είναι σχετικά παλιό, 30-40 χρόνια, το θέμα του Design of Experiments. Και μάλλον γρήγορα θα γυρίσω στα ελληνικά, αλλά α, εάν έχετε ερωτήσεις θα μπορώ και να τις ακούσω και να τις α, απαντήσω στα ελληνικά. Υπό μία όμως υποσυλίωση ότι οι αρχικές ερωτήσεις θα πρέπει να είναι από σπουδαστές. Οπότε και προκυριακούς και μεταπτυχιακούς. Λοιπόν, όπως θα αναλύω το ορισμένα θέματα, πιαστείτε, σας το λέω εξαρτής, από κάτι και ρωτήστε. Εάν νομίζετε πως η ερώτησή σας θα είναι απλή και ε, όχι σημαντική, απατάστε 200%. Λοιπόν, έχετε αυτό υπόψη σας. Δεν θα πάρω άλλες ερωτήσεις εάν δεν πάρω ένα άλφα αριθμό, τον οποίο αυτή τη στιγμή τον αφήνω μυστικό. Α, θα σας μιλήσω λίγο για μοντελοποίηση και αρχικά θα ξεκινήσω με ορισμένες κλασικές ιδέες και μετά θα σας πω ορισμένα πράγματα από αυτά που ασχολούμαι τα τελευταία δεκα χρόνια. Οπότε, αρχικά ενδιαφέρον να σας πω για τα είδη των μοντέλων που αυτή τη στιγμή με ενδιαφέρουν και ενδιαφέρουν την ευρύτερη κοινότητα. Α, θα σας μιλήσω για τη βασική μεθοδολογία του Design of Experiments, που δεν ξέρω αν έχετε εσείς κάποιο προπτυχιακό μάθημα επί τούτου. Και μετά θα προχωρήσω σε δύο γενικοποιήσεις αυτής της μεθοδολογίας, τις οποίες τις ονομάζω Design of Dynamic Experiments, και δεν Dynamic Response Surface Models α, είναι η δεύτερη. Μετά θα σας μιλήσω για ορισμένες εφαρμογές. Πάντα θεωρώ τον εαυτό μου περισσότερο μηχανικό, παρότι μου αρέσουν τα μαθηματικά, όχι μαθηματικό, α, και περισσότερο μηχανικό από ό,τι φυρμοσμένο επιστήμονα. Ως εκ τούτου πάντα και από τότε που ήμουν στο Λιχάι και τώρα έχω σχέσεις με τη βιομηχανία, θα σας μιλήσω για ένα project που είχαμε με την Pfizer και το οποίο το συνεχίζουμε με την Pfizer και την Merck. Θα σας μιλήσω επιγραμμικά για ένα project που είχαμε και τελειώνουμε τώρα με την DAO. Δεν θα σας μιλήσω γι' αυτό γιατί δεν θα με πάρει ο χρόνος, αλλά σαφέστατα θα μπορούσαμε να το κουβεδιάσουμε αργότερα. Και μετά θα έχουμε ορισμένα συγκεράσματα. Αυτό που εγώ λέω knowledge driven models is the type of models that uh, some people, maybe you too, will call them fundamental models. Uh, 
I think the, the definition of knowledge driven models is more accurate because, the, because you write the model motivated by what you know about the process. Uh, you write uh, material energy balances, you might write them at steady state or in dynamics. But the key thing is that you need to know what's happening inside the process that you're trying to model. The argument is that in many practical applications, and in industrial applications as well, it is not necessarily true that you know everything about the in, inside workings of the process. You would like to, but uh, once you develop such a model, you would then have parameters that they are known, and you will estimate the parameters from the data. That will be called parameter estimation, which will need the substantial knowledge uh, on uh, optimization techniques to find the best parameters that, um, that will minimize the difference between what the model predicts and what the data tells you. But one essential requirement, of course, is that you should have more experiments than parameters. That, that's usually something that everybody knows and everybody, uh, everybody understands. If you have as many experiments as parameters, you could end up with a model that it is useless uh, because you could not predict anything new. But one thing that it is often missing uh, from my experimental colleagues is a set of replicated experiments, usually three, preferably five, possibly at the same operating conditions. And of course, if you do the same experiment again and again and again, you're not going to get the same results. You're going to get results that will vary from each other. And in order to do, uh, if you do that, then you should calculate the average value of these results and you also calculate the sum of squares. And that would be the sum of squares and P's for the pure error. That sum of squares is a very critical parameter that many experimentalists, again, I'm not experimentalist, but I can don't do it. This is the uh, minimum sum of squares. This is, in essence, the definition of zero. That part you cannot model. Because if you do the process in the same conditions, you know, the air would change, your movement of your hands is going to change, the variability in the raw materials would change. That you have no control over it. And thus, you should not, be, you should not uh, try to model that much detail. Um, the modeling assumption, of course, uh, many times uh, the people who write models see it as a one-way street. And that's another fatal mistake, uh, because this one-way street, or this perceived one-way street, starts with assumptions. You're going to make assumptions whether the mixing is well mixed or it's not well mixed, uh, what are the reactions, what is the stoichiometry, what the kinetic expressions, what are the heat and mass transformation. In order to write any model, you have to make assumptions and write down. But you often, well, we often, let's, let's not take myself outside of this dance, uh, we do not come back to check whether our assumptions are correct or not. Um, then you have to ideally design the experiments instead of just randomly select the conditions. And then collect the data and maybe uh, count the parameters and estimate then you estimate the parameters in order to minimize the sum of squares, the difference between the predicted value and the experimental value, right? And then you select the number of parameters so that this sum of squares is the minimum possible. And of course, that's another part in which optimization techniques are necessary in order to do that. Uh, and again, this step is you know, parameter estimation. You can even find the uh, whole books written on it. That much people do do. Sometimes they, beca they, beca they become enamored. Uh, they become prisoners of the optimization technique. And once they manage to solve this problem, they congratulate themselves and call it quiz. They fail to do this last step, which I think is the most critical step, at least in my side of, of the game, is to do the lack of fit test. And the lack of fit test says 
that the, is the sum of squares that we minimize of the same order as the pure error in the process. Because if the, this sum of squares is equal to 10 and this sum of squares is equal to 100, that means there is substantial non-random information that your model has not represented. And then you have to scratch your head and say, Zim, some of my assumptions is not correct. I have to go back and update my model. Don't ask me how. That is the intuitive, the non-logical, or at least uh, it's not a, a one-way street, and update the model until the sum of squares is about the same order of magnitude. And of course, this comparison, it is comparison of sum of squares. It is an F-test in applied statistics. Uh, that is important and important to do. So to some extent, with knowledge-driven models, and many people write knowledge-driven models, my, my complaint is that people don't do that because this one is going to force them to say, hey, let me go back and my model needs change and update. So, of course, um, nowadays there is a big issue. Of course, if we go back to the 1960s, right, when I entered the Senate graduate and so forth, in that case the models were very crude, there were correlations, and then, and then the Amundsonian school of thought from Minnesota came and said we ought to write fundamental models, knowledge-driven models. But nowadays there is another big wave and you might have heard about the big data challenge. People think that there's, there are a lot of data, and certainly in many fields um, this is indeed true. And in chemical engineering, possibly it is true, especially with a lot of, of uh, historical data. You know, since, since the 60s and 70s, all chemical plants have been operated by digital control computers, and there's been substantial amount of data that have been collected. Of course, many people might think that this is this is, uh, this is uh, a gold mine that ought to be mined. So there is an updated interest in big data. Actually, many people have started saying that there is a new type of science that we should do, although I'm not totally convinced. Data science. That's the new type of science. I don't believe that's science, but nevertheless. So there is an ever-increasing amount of historical data, and there are methods that could be used, and there are some linear but steady state methods like PCA, principal, uh, principal component analysis, PLS is not principal component analysis, partial least squares, and then when one does DOE and the models that they are developed, uh, response surface models, are both steady state, they, are, they might be non-linear but they are steady state if they are dynamic as this might be they're linear, so to some extent there is need to enhance this type of data-driven methods and hopefully uh, our contribution is in these two extensions of the design of experiments methodology. Design of experiments is a course, an elective course that, that uh, I teach both for undergraduate and graduate students usually in the spring. And it is a topic of, to some extent, applied statistics. It's a topic that if a U.S. trained chemical engineer is hired by a certain company, uh, right away they're going to tell them, go learn design of experiments. It is the methodology that enables you to collect the maximum number of information about your experiment for a given set of experiments. Who wouldn't want to do that? Or, if you want, to minimize the number of experiments to get the information you want. And, uh, if, uh, uh, so what I'm going to tell you today, just to start, is usually when, when my graduate students are ready to give a presentation, I said, first you should start and tell your audience what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So this is the first part. What I'm going to tell you in this part is I'm going to tell you about these two generalizations. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of mathematics, I'm going to primarily tell you the concepts. So design of dynamic experiments and then the dynamic response surface uh, model. <coughs> and then we're going to use these two experiments to model processes that they are not well understood and for which processes you cannot write a fundamental or a knowledge-driven model. 
you know, knowledge-driven models have been primarily used and have been very effective in, in large-scale chemical processes, petroleum, petrochemicals, uh, bulk chemicals. But for specialty chemicals, for food processing and for pharmaceuticals, it is not quite clear that knowledge-driven models are economically viable. They are possible. But you have to keep in mind how long would I have to spend to develop a knowledge-driven model and what would be the potential economical return and if the process has a small production rate, the economics might not be there. So to some extent, knowledge-driven models might not be economical for many processes and that's the interest for data-driven modeling. And in some circumstances, I will tell you that from the data-driven model, we'll, uh, we'll end up getting further understanding of the process. This will be the uh, sample process with the Pfizer science. Um, so design experiments, so let's go back to it. Uh, and if you know already about it, uh, I apologize for the summary, but if you don't know about it, I think I want to tell you a few things that might motivate you to become more interested. So, you design experiments, and in essence, if you have three conditions that you want to vary, you would vary these conditions simultaneously, not one at a time, and I'll tell you why. So in this case, there are three conditions, and this is a full factorial design. Usually, you might have a high and a low value, or let's say, on the temperature, the concentration, or let's say, the pressure of your experiment, and you will vary them, and you'll end up doing these eight experiments, the eight experiments is two to the third. But if you have ten variables, that's two to the tenth. Or if you have eleven variables. And of course, if you have eleven things that can affect your experiment, a lot of times what you might do is, ah, forget about this, I'm going to only examine three. And that's always a mistake, because who said that you know which three are the most important? You do that because you don't want to do too many experiments and because you don't know how to do fractional factorial designs. And this is one half of the full, one quarter of the full, one eighth of the full factorial design in order to cut down on the number of experiments. I'll give you an example of such a thing. So if you do one half, instead of doing the experiments at all eight places of the cube, you're going to do them at least four. In this form, not any other random choice of four. Uh, there is uh, other experiment, center composite, in which you do it at the edges, but also you do it uh, and so forth. And here is the first test. If you were to only do five experiments, which one would you do, the red or the green? Of course, I told you that already, right? You're going to do the red, right? Huh? The green. People do the red though. People do the red, let's say that this is temperature and concentration, you just try to do some chemical reaction, right? They do the red for two reasons. First of all, they don't apply statistics. That's the first fine. And secondly, they are impatient. They want to change the temperature and see what's happening to the results of the experiment. I change the temperature, is the experiment better or worse? And since concentration is better or worse, you can really see it after the first experiment what's happening. When you do these, you change both the temperature and the composition, you don't know which one caused the better or worse results, and you are impatient. Here you have to do all four of them. The same number of experiments, this is more informative because it considers the simultaneous change of both. If the temperature from here to there was positive, who said that from here to there will be positive? Okay? So that's the starting point. Here is a set of experiments in which I have eight conditions. And of course, 2 to the 8 is 32 times 8 quite a few experiments. You can only can not do that many. So let's say that you can afford to do only 32. Then you have to design the 1 8 fractional design. And you have to know how to design it. This is sort of 
the design. Uh, you don't see the numbers here, but the blue ones are plus one and the red ones are minus one, the lowest and the highest value of the ten, one, two, three, four, ten columns. Doing this experiment, uh, this is then called a resolution for design. That's a code name as to what information you could uh, you could uh, doing this experiment. You can uh, uh, model. You can see how the output. Of course, you have to do all the experiments before you do the analysis. You then can see how the output y, the result that you're interested in, depends on the individual conditions, the ten and also on the combined conditions, two terms at a time. You don't know the effect of three terms at a time, but who cares about those, right? I mean, you need more experiments to do. So in this case, you will have that. If, and then the model that you're gonna collect, this is the response surface model, it is a polynomial interpolative model that has a constant term, which is the average value of all the experiments, the effect of one of the eight conditions by themselves and the effect of the combined conditions for two changes. Of course, because it is re resolution four, it means that the effect of the individual species is not mixed up with the two-term effects, and this is sort of some of the small details in the design. If you had only changed one factor at a time, you possibly do 16 experiments, 8 times 2, one half of the effort, but you will be missing on all these interaction effects. Your model will be more than 10 times worse, and less informative, okay, for the same amount of effort. So to some extent, that's, that's the background. Um, so once you do design of experiments, then you develop this RSM models, uh, I showed some examples already. Uh, this is the simplest one where you have only linear terms and that minimizes the number of experiments. In essence here you have n coefficients, n plus 1, and usually you will do n plus 1 plus 3 uh, experiments, more than the number of parameters. And uh, here are more elaborate models. This is this type of response surface model is the two-factor interaction model. Here is the quadratic because you have quadratic. You could keep going on in cubic and, and fourth order, but of course, as you have more detailed models, the number of coefficients increases and the number of experiments increases, and usually you will not wait. You will do experiments and calculate this because you initially don't know the window of the best operating conditions and then that window could move later on to more different conditions. And then you do ANOVA, analysis of areas, that's why you need to take a class. And when you estimate these parameters, you have to estimate them and also the uncertainty of this parameter. And of course, if the uncertainty is larger than the value, if that confidence interval contains zero, that parameter is insignificant and you throw it out. So you don't really keep all the parameters in the model. And yes, you need some statistics. It's not that difficult. It's much easier than calculus. So, the limitations of DOE is that the inputs do not vary with time. So why keep the reaction temperature constant? You know, the factors, the DOE methodology, the factors are the inputs, the conditions, uh, they're called factors. And they're all time invariant, they don't change with time. Who said that if I'm going to do a batch experiment for a reactor, that the reactor temperature should be constant with time? It's actually, uh, when I give this talk in the United States, I says, you know, one of my avocations is to cook a leg of lamb. Who said that cooking a leg of lamb should be, uh, put it in the oven, it should be at a constant temperature, right? Of course, the, the existing ovens don't have a computer to specify a time varying temperature, but ideally I would like to raise the temperature, burn the outside of the leg of lamb, and then slowly cook it 
keeping all the juices inside. Of course, the question is, what is the optimum temperature versus time profile for cooking a leg of lamb if you want to do that? So that's a limitation of the design of experiments. And the other limitation of the classical design of experiments is that usually measurements are made at the end of the experiment, and there is a model about the end conversion, if you wish, of the reaction. But nowadays, with uh, modern instrumentation, with uh, spectroscopic measurements, with uh, robotic uh, um, sample and uh, uh, gas chromatograph or liquid chromatograph testing, you could have compositions throughout the batch experiment. Uh, and if you have, if you have uh, measurements every hour for 12 hours that the experiment does, are you going to make a model a separate model for the first hour, a separate model for the third hour, a separate model for the twelfth hour? That's not elegant enough. That's not useful enough. So in this case, we're going to have dynamic response surface models where we're going to model time result outputs, and I will explain that soon. So here is the DODE, the design of dynamic experiments. And the design of dynamic experiments, instead of defining an upper and a lower value within which you are going to vary the temperature constant. Now we're going to define an upper and a lower temperature profile within which we're going to do the experiments. Jokingly, let's say that this is the cooking temperature for my mother cooking the leg of lamb and this is my grandmother's cooking temperature and I want to try something between the two. This you have to decide what's appropriate for your process. I cannot tell you that. And that is the initial guess, that region, that domain of experimentation might end up changing as you learn more about the process. And in that, then the important variable which is, uh, the, 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 uh, so let's say if this is the temperature, there will be a reference temperature, the middle point, and then there will be the width of the domain, and then this variable z of tau, or tap, as I should say, in Athens, uh, is the fractional change up and down from the middle, and it varies between plus and minus one. This is, this is called a coded variable, just mostly because it's uh, between plus and minus one. It is dimensionless, and we can clearly uh, define all our inputs this way. So this is the input variable, the function of time, which of course is a function of time, is, is uh, Infinite, infinite dimensional. Uh, and uh, it is within this domain that uh, we're going to define the time varying inputs. So, in order to make the set of experiments manageable, that is, finite number of experiments, we're going to parameterize this time varying input in terms of the safety pleasant polynomial. So in this case, if we have n such polynomials, there will be n coefficients that we have to specify x1, x2, xn. And usually when I start doing this type of experiments, n most likely will initially be equal to 2, maybe equal to 3. It will not be that many. Um, and here are the safety result polynomials. The safety result polynomials is nothing mystical. It's just the polynomials which are orthogonal in the domain between 0 and 1. Uh, zero is the beginning of the experiment, one is the end of the experiment. It makes the life uh, easier. So here is a set of experiments. Suppose that I have only two polynomials. I have two, two coefficients, which I call dynamic sub-factors. Uh, here is the time domain. It is instead of having the temperature constant with time, let's take the next simplest case, linear with time. In which case, we have to specify two coefficients, the average value of the temperature, and this, which indicates the slope. So you can see that if this is zero, if the two values is zero, zero, it's steady at the middle. If it is one, zero, it's the top. If it is minus one, zero at the bottom, and then you have this linear profile. Here is the values of these coefficients in the x1, x2, x2 domain. And of course, if I take these linear profiles and I translate them into my 
a strange domain <laughs> that will become bended, mostly because the boundaries are bended. The, uh, this, these two profiles is exactly the previous <coughs> profiles, which of course are within a, a parallelogram. Now when you put them inside these two profiles, they become bended. Nothing, nothing special. If you want to have a more detailed input profile, you can involve three polynomials. You now have three coefficients. The number of experiments is going to increase. So this is how they will look, and so forth. So, we do design of experiments in DOD, in the dynamic version, the same way it was done before. We collect the data, we estimate the response surface model with multilinear regression. These are some of the models that you will see, and then this is the response surface model, and then you can use it in many circumstances to find out what are the values of x1, x2, x3, which will maximize or minimize the final value, conversion, selectivity, whatever else is in, 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 uh, the, in your experiment. So let us uh, look at some simple cases. This is actually the simplest case that uh, we did. Let's say, uh, we're not going to do experiments, we're going to simulate a simple batch reaction of a reversible chemistry, first order kinetics, forward and backward. Uh, the only difference is that the activation energy of the reverse reaction is higher than the activation of the, of the forward, which of course would imply that you should not operate at the highest temperature. Thermodynamics would be against you. If you know the kinetics perfectly, you can do what's called model-based optimization. You calculate through a very detailed knowledge-driven model what is the optimum temperature, and the optimum temperature is to be flat at the highest possible value and then to decrease almost exponentially to the lowest value. Here is the constraint between 15 and 50. So this one is at 50 and then it decreases. This is if you have the detailed model. Right? If you knew everything and what you knew is 100% accurate, which is usually not always the case, but the conversion is 74 and a half. Now, if you do a data-driven uh, experiment, and let us do DOE first, we're going to do experiments at the highest, the lowest, and the middle value of the temperature constant good time. We know nothing about the kinetics. We're going to develop the data-driven model and going to optimize with respect to the conversion. Uh, we're going to get 71.4, as I said, plus or minus. Ah, close, but we're really missing about 3%, which might be quite a bit of money. We're going to do DOE, DODE, as I will explain in a second. Uh, it's going to be only with linear. And it's a linear, you're going to have a linear temperature increase or decrease, because keep in mind, now I don't know whether the activation rate is higher or lower. I don't know whether I need to go a decrease in temperature or, well, or a steady temperature at the top. I don't know that. And then, of course, since you know this, you're going to say, hey, you're going to have a linear temperature profile and it's going to come close to this? You're crazy. Yes. We were crazy, but then we got lucky. Well, actually, it's not lucky. It's part of luck. 74%. 74.3. Almost identical. And in this experiment, you know nothing about the kinetics. In this, you know everything. And it's 100% accurate. So, so, we did this. This is the optimum constant temperature. This is not DOD, this is DOE, I apologize, and this is the optimum linear temperature. So the fact that the data-driven solution gave me a linear temperature profile, not the exponential, I didn't sacrifice too much. That was sort of a very good initial point. You can see that with DOE, we got 71%, with the model base, it's 74%. The, there are 3% difference between Design of dynamic experiment with just a little bit more additional experiments, we got almost very close. So that was the first example we did, and we thought, ah, maybe the idea is not that crazy. Here's another example in which you have a more complex stoichiometry, A plus B going to C, 
That's the desired product. But uh, the reactant B decides to give you a byproduct. The desired product degrades into something else. These are the kinetics. Of course, if you know about this stoichiometry, you are not going to fit all of B at the beginning of the batch. You're going to fit it in semi batch mode. But then the question is, what would be the incoming flow rate of B? Should it be constant, linear, in essence, and how long will, how long should uh, the duration of the batch be in order to maximize whatever you want to maximize? So we do a set of design of dynamic experiments. You see that the experiments are curved. We also change the batch time. Some of them finish at one hour, half hour, or an hour and a half. We develop the, the RSM model. We develop the RSM model in this case. And if you want to maximize the concentration of the product at the end of the batch, this is the feeding profile for B, the optimum feeding profile. But if you want to maximize the granules of the product divided by the batch time, because that might be a more meaningful economical benefit, right? Because I don't want to wait for three centuries to get the maximum concentration. I want to get it quickly, and even if it's less, and then have another batch and another batch. So this is the, uh, the optimum feeding profile for the core reactant to be. Now the second part, the second generalization. So I'm done with the first generalization. The first generalization is how to define time varying input. And the way to do that is a simple one, parameterized with shifted Lezan polynomials. We can discuss whether shifted Lezan polynomials are the best for every case. So imagine that we have a small molecule, new pharmaceutical, which actually describes the application that uh, we did for Pfizer. Uh, of course, the main reaction is no. Right? Why the hell would you be interested in making this reaction? You know, you know you're going to make, it, let's say, aspirin. But usually when you try to make aspirin or aspirin whatever, and when you produce that, you're concerned about all the byproducts, which could be impurities leading to allergies, poisons, and whatnot. And in many, reality, in many circumstances, you want to understand what these byproducts are. So you're going to do a design of experiments. Uh, or DOE or DOD in the case that uh, the data that uh, Pfizer gave us was DOE. And then measure the composition of all species, 10 species, every hour for 12 hours. And they say, okay, here are the species, model it. Not only model it, but tell us what is the stoichiometry happening inside the reaction. That's that's the important part. Because when they do the experiments, they have gas chromatography, and in you know, the gas chromatography, they get a, a hemp, another hemp, another hemp. They know the main species, but there are a lot of the intermediates say, what the hell is this? You know, there is something there. We call it uh, compound C or X or whatever. And a lot of times, they might not even know the stoichiometry, uh, decomposition. So because it is measurements every hour for 12 hours, am I going to develop an RSM for the results on the first hour, the second hour, the 12th hour? As I said before, that's, that's not very... So here is the DRSM idea. The RSM I showed you before, it is the end result at the end of the experiment and how it is influenced by the input conditions x1, x2, Xn. Okay. Now, I'm not only able to measure the end result, let's say the conversion or the concentration, at the end of the experiment, but I'm going to measure it in between. So the idea to move from RSM to DRSM is a simple one. Many things in life, many things both in life and in science are simple. But it is not as simple to understand how simple they are. I also say to my students when I take an exam, the answers will be very simple. 
there will be two or three lines answer, and if you end up writing three pages, you are in the wrong direction. The answers are simple, but it's not, sim it's not as easy to see how simple they are. Okay? So in this case, the answer is, okay, if I'm going to have data that vary with time, let's make these constants be functions of time. Of course, I'm going to parameterize them because I do not want to have an infinitely detailed description of this function. And I'm going to parameterize them again with shifted Lezan polynomials. So for each such function, I need to calculate the corresponding gamma coefficients. And in this case, there will be R such gammas for each one of these bitters. So there will be R model parameters for each description, and we will assume that I have K data points throughout the ex each experiment. And of course, the only limitation is that R should be less than K. I'm going to go back into this simple example, and now I'm going to develop DRSMs, dynamic response surface models, for how the reactance concentration, the co-reactance concentration, the product and the byproducts concentrations change with time. And here is one example of the C product. This is one set of experiments, this is another set, one and another experiment. And in this case, you see that I have six measurements throughout the uh, duration of the experiment. I'm using K5 polynomials, R, and it's accurate. Here I have 10 measurements, and I'm using 5 polynomials. It's equally accurate. Uh, but of course, if I give you 10 data points, you don't know that five polynomials is going to be sufficient, right? A lot of times you might go with higher. This is nine polynomials. The two models are identical. The reason is when we split the parameters, we use what we call stepwise regression. Stepwise regression determines which coefficients are significant or not. And in this case, if you go to see the models, all these additional polynomials from the fifth to the ninth were given the opportunity to contribute to the model, but they were kicked out. They were not necessary. So in essence, you have the minimum number of, 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 of parameters to, to do it. So now, here comes the part C, which is, uh, you know, in essence, is not C, it's B2. It has to do with DRSM. But it has to do with an important utilization of the DRSM model, a data-driven model, to move you into process nodes. Be careful. From the data, we're going to learn something. And now we have a model for the reactant A, the co-reactant B, how they change with time. If there is measurement error, this measurement error has been filtered out because these functions, you know, there are specific values, all these, if you plot these functions there, if the data were like this and noisy, the functions would have eliminated, uh, has smoothened the data. These models do not model the experimental data for one experiment, they model the experimental data for all the experiments because they incorporate the different input values that you have used for these conditions, right? This, these were the, you know, in this case, they were describing how the input profile of B was uh, parameterized. So what you can do now, since you already know calculus, right? What's calculus for in Greek? Yeah, for the course of English. Yeah, for the course of English. Okay. Yeah, for it was what was the dilemmic analysis? Well, analysis is a little bit more than the introductory. Uh, so you can take this 
and differentiate with time. If you differentiate with time, of course, you differentiate not only for one conditions, but for all, all durations, for all experiments. And if you differentiate with time, in essence, you calculate the rate of appearance and the rate of disappearance of each of the species. Now, with the exception of B, with the exception of B, the rate of appearance of A is equal to the rate of the corresponding reaction that it participated, because it's in batch. So you put it initially. Uh, the same with C. You don't remove C, you don't put C, so the rate, the, the, the derivative of the concentration is how much C appeared, and of course, maybe how much of C disappeared due to the side reaction. For B, it's going to be a little bit different. For B, it's going to be a little bit different because for B, you have to take the derivative and you have to subtract the volumetric incoming flow rate divided by the volume. Uh, these rates are paid unit volume because you've added something. So the rate of change of this concentration is due to the reaction rate that B undergone and how much was put in. But now, as I said, you calculate all these rates and you can plot them. Uh, in uh, this blue one is the rate for A. It starts, it's negative because it is a reactant and then it goes, it does not cross. But for C, it's the yellow, it's this one. For C, it's positive and then it, grows, uh, it crosses and goes negative because it goes to byproduct. Okay? And then here is for another experiment. So now you have a, uh, an understanding how the species have appeared or disappeared. What you do then, you collect all this data for the number of experiments, and is the number of experiments. Each data matrix is given here. It has as many columns as the species that you have measured. A, B, C, D, E. The rows is the different time instance for that specific experiment. And now, if you measure the composition at five time instants, you can calculate this one at a hundred time instance because you're calculating from the model. You don't do, in essence, you do differentiation of the model you developed, not the data. Because if you only have five data points in an experiment, calculating the derivatives is, is a very approximate. So you collect that. And then you stack all these matrices, matrices one on top of each other. One important observation is that this going down is a time varying information. Varies with the time on each, ex on each experiment and varies with each different experiment. This information is time invariant. It, it has the secret of how the five species are interrelated through the stoichiometry, which I do not know at the moment. So the overall matrix will be 900 by 5. But in this case, I had nine experiments, and I collected 800 points for each experiment. Then I do a very important calculation. How many of you know singular value decomposition? Nobody? How many of you know eigenvalue decomposition? Nobody? They are supposed to know. Where is the mathematical background of chemical engineers? I can see that the more of them are first. I can value you. You know how to calculate eigenvalue. Don't tell me you don't, right? But eigenvalues, you calculate them when the matrix is square. Singular values, you calculate when the matrix is non-square. And it is, in essence, a cousin of, of eigenvalues. So to some extent, what we want to do, well, you know what the rank of a matrix is? 
Huh? How do you calculate the random matrix? One way to calculate the random matrix is to calculate the singular values of the matrix because the random matrix is concept not only for square matrices, it's also for, for non-square matrices. So in this case, what you're asking, to the first thing that you're trying to ask is what is the rank of this matrix? To do that, you calculate the singular values. The singular values, the maximum number of singular values is equal to the smallest of the two dimensions, which in this case is five. And you look at the five singular values and you determine how many of them are significantly different than zero. And if you want, there are statistical tests that you can do it, but just looking at them, you can see uh, you know, which are the three major ones and whether the fourth and fifth singular vectors, they're orthogonal, they tell me what, they tell me a lot of things about the time varying things in this mixture. Here are the three significant values, and the right hand side, there are three rows, again orthogonal, and they tell me the time invariant information, which is how the how these five compositions change relative to each other. Now, because these are mathematical constructs, here, here are the numbers. They are the secret in finding out what is the true stoichiometry of the reaction. Now, of course, if I give you this one, and I tell you to give me the stoichiometry, you won't be able to find it because, as I said, this is a mathematical construct you have to have the code to unlock the secret. The each of the reactions taking place will be a linear combination of these three. But of course, which linear combination? Okay? So the idea is maybe what you can do is you could postulate the hypothetical reactions, and then this is the matrix N of the two reactions, and if you project it in this vector, if the stoichiometry comes on the other side identical, that's a true stoichiometry. Uh, we develop a score which goes from 0 to 100, and in this case it's 97.4, right? And you know, this is the stoichiometry that I started with. I changed the minus 2 to minus 1, just one of the two reactions, the score is not so good. Now, uh, I tested three reactions at a time. You can test one reaction at a time, actually. And that score would apply 
you can do the test. Uh, so for example, if I get that bad score, is there something is wrong here, I can test this one, will give me good results, I can test the last one, will give me good results, this middle one will give me bad results, and then I can say maybe I need to think. So to some extent, you can serve with this analysis of the data, which the design with this DRSM methodology facilitates greatly uh, than before, is to go from the data-driven model to knowledge about the stoichiometry. Okay? And if, indeed, you have good guesses, because at the moment, uh, we mostly depend on guesses. The next step is to try to, to solve this problem without guesses, but that's not yet solved. If you have good guesses, you have the stoichiometry, possible stoichiometry, then what you can do is you can translate the rate of change of the species by a certain single matrix rotation into the reaction rates for the first reaction, the second reaction, and the third reaction. So now you have for reaction one, uh, the main reaction, for reaction two, the orange, and then for reaction three, the yellow one. This is for experiment four, this is for experiment eight. Okay? So now what you have is you have the rate of the first reaction at all the experiments and at all the times. You also have the composition of the reactants. You know who, which the reactants are. And thus, you can estimate the kinetic model one reaction at a time, not the whole three reactions. That's a much easier modeling task for the kinetics. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what, uh, uh, what Pfizer threw at us. So what did I just tell you? I told you, I'm gonna, I told you what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> We're not on tier 5? No. Well, anyhow, maybe I can stop here and then uh, not give you the results of the experiment. Of the, and uh, so, uh, DRSM is a generalization of the RSM. Data driven models can lead you into knowledge driven models. Um, I could, but I will not tell you about an experimental study about uh, a diastereomeric reaction at neighboring Sunovian pharmaceuticals, I can tell you about uh, in which we determined with a set of experiments that a decrease in temperature profile will have a much better uh, selectivity to the design product. I can tell you about the Dow polymerization reactor in which uh, I designed a set of dynamic experiments and without knowing very anything about the in internal workings of the polymerization process, I was able to operate that batch process with 20% less time and get the same product, the same amount of polymer with the same qualities of product, which implies an increase in productivity. If the polymer is oversold, you have two choices, either to shorten the batch time or to build another plant. That's a substantial. Uh, and I can tell you about the Pfizer example in which we're given uh, data from 10 species involved in 8 reactions and I'll just give you the Pfizer business. Get the butter down. Here's some of the data we'll find. It. For the Pfizer, here are the true reactions. The projection, they give us uh, 14 reactions. So here's the reactions. Let's see whether you can come back with the correct, correct reactions, right? Uh, seven of the eight projected perfectly well. Uh, this is, well, we're not yet sure where to draw the line perfectly well, okay? Um, so uh, you can say that six projected well. The other two were minuscule reactions where the compounds were such small compositions that it was comparable to the experimental error. I'm not a magician, I can tell you that. He's, these are six reactions that were not true, and we were able to discard them and say, no, they're not true. So I'm going to stop here, leave that slide up, and uh, give you more details on the other applications, if you so wish, but we don't have time. Anyway.
the message that I came across, I think, that uh, data-driven uh, science is revealing of uh, knowledge. In some circumstances, correct. Of course, I presented the two extremes, knowledge-driven models versus data-driven models. The ideal circumstance is when we're able, which we're not, at least I'm not, to have what I call hybrid models. What if, in a given process, we know some things, we don't know everything to write a knowledge-driven model, how we can complement that knowledge with some data. Ερωτήσεις από τα κρατήρια και η οδηγία που πήραμε προηγουμένως ήταν ε, ότι απαιτεί ο ομιλητής μας οι ερωτήσεις πρώτες να προέρχονται να αποφυγείς. Συνιστώ. Γεια. Ευχαριστώ. Λοιπόν, έχω να σας ρωτήσω πολλές ερωτήσεις, αλλά πρώτα απ' όλα, έχετε ένα μεγάλο σημαντικό στις πρώτες σημαντικές για την ευρωπαϊκή. This particular, this particular value comes from the general data, comes uh, as the average uh, value of the experiments? Yeah, from, from all the experiments. Okay. This is the predicted value at, uh, at uh, a given time and at a given experiment. And the SS uh, predicted for the fitting comes from the data also? Or yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, this, is, this, this value is calculated from the experiments who are repeated at a given condition. Let's say you do, you do, you do the same experiment three, three, five times, okay. right? How can someone decide how many more experiments he should uh, do? Right, so excellent question. Um, uh, you should have more experiments than Parameters. We will see. We will make the shorter parameter of parameters. The other, the other is three parameters, three parameters. The model is in a technical way to perform the three experiments. And as a result, we will model the not only the activity, but also the noise that is emitted. So if we can add some more, one, two, three, and perform. Ένα, πολυ... ένα δεύτερο, δεύτερο βαθμό πολυνόμιο, θα σου πιάσει και τη στιγμή. Αυτό είναι, είναι ανάθεμα από την πράξη τη στατίστηση. Ποτέ ποτέ δεν πρέπει να γίνει. Μάλιστα είχε ένα συνάδελφο καθηγητή στο Λιχάρι που λέει: Κοίταξε, αν έχει το πρόβλημα με τη στατιστική, ότι έχει τρία σημεία, περνά μια καμπύλη από εκεί και πα πίσω. Λέω: Ακριβώ αυτό είναι το πρόβλημα, αν ξέρει στατιστική, αυτό ποτέ δεν πρέπει. Uh, so, uh, we have uh, in the audience Brandon who comes from Edinburgh, so it's better if we switch to English. Oh, no problem. So we, uh, well, thank you. Make part of the discussion. Feedback and quote. So, uh, there should always be more experiments than parameters. Because if as many experiments parameters, you fit the data perfectly well, and then you try to extrapolate, and you get totally unacceptable predictions. So then the question is, how many more experiments? In the design of experiment techniques uh, uh, methodology, there is this full factorial, fractional factorial, and whatnot. And there is a more advanced methodology, which, uh, which is called optimal design of experiments, which is not necessarily picking up, uh, for example, the domain could be a cooked domain, just because this area is lead to explosion, you want to do experiments there. So there's optimal design. Uh, let me cut the chase. Usually, the way I do experiments, design experiments, I calculate the number of parameters, and then I add three or five additional experiments, which are different. So to some extent, I'll have uh, three or five more experiments than parameters. Now, so if I have seven parameters, I'll have maybe ten experiments. Now the question is, how do you determine the 10 experiments? Because they might not fit in a hypercube or whatever, in a regular thing. Usually they yeah, utilize them with those called optimal design experiments, which uh, uh, determines what to do the experiments in order to give you certain statistical results for the results, or for the variance. So there are methods. Uh, 
Uh, and also and, but on top of these three additional experiments, which three additional experiments will help you calculate the lack of P, uh, I will do three or five repeated experiments, usually at the center of the domain, or you can do it uh, in some other form. Repeated experiments to calculate the pure error. Right. Now, the repeated experiments are not for validation. You might say that the three additional experiments are for validation, although here you don't separate the data into modeling data and validation data. That's another approach. Um, uh, sometimes industrial people tell me that this estimation of the pure error in the process by these repeat experiments is not very accurate because you have to do quite a few experiments. And we had a bit of a dialogue with the statistician at uh, Merit. Um, uh, because in their case, they would prefer to do cross-validation. So have a certain number, let's say, you have 7500, do 10 experiments, and another five experiments. We develop the model with the 10 experiments, and then you uh, uh, five experiments to test, <coughs> to cross-validate. Does okay. the model predict the data which was not, or not involved in fitting the model? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, also if it is necessary in any case. Let's say, for example, I choose to do five experiments, and do each one of these five more than once. Uh, now, how many, how many repeat experiments you will do is also very important. You can do five, you know, but if you do five experiments, your model should not have more than four parameters, right? Uh, um, there are um, there are lots of you know you're getting into the design experiments, uh, uh, for example. There are two statistical uh, tests for the set of experiments. You know, in, in whatever you conclude, you could come up with two faulty results. Faulty results of, of type 1 and faulty results of type 2. So let's say that in all these experiments, you are giving, you are, you are testing some hypothesis. I'm giving you now a so hypothesis is that the conversion does not depend on temperature, right? So you, in order to, do statist to statistically define the proper, so uh, you, this hypothesis that you test, you can say there, there are three possibilities, there are four possibilities. This hypothesis is true, and you conclude that it is true. This hypothesis is true, and you conclude that it is false. That is mistake of type 1. The other two possibilities is that this hypothesis is not true, and you conclude that it is not true. And it is not true, and you conclude that it is, it is true. That's a different mistake. Right? Uh, the, and there are two types of of statistics that you ought to be aware of, what is the certainty with which you're going to prove a certain thing, and what is the possibility that what you concluded is not the correct one. And the number of the repeated experiments has a substantial impact on excluding you the second type of fault. And this is quantified by something that's called the power of the design, which tells you how many repeated experiments you do. And this is often not followed, okay? Because often you are, you know, if you were to do a small experiment, uh, and a, a table, table talk that you make a certain gadget that you want to have tensile strength, and you can do, you know, quite a few experiments, that's one sport. But if I were to be doing these experiments in a bioreactor that lasts for a week, and then I need to do, you know, 15 sets, by after experiments. I cannot afford to duplicate these 15 experiments twice or three times. So 
Uh, but in certain, you know, knowing some of these statistics, you could quote unquote safeguard yourself. What is the chance that I made a mistake? And it's a different way to validate that your calculations are correct. If it were. Well, your calculations should be always correct. You usually do them in MATLAB or something else. Uh, uh, given, you know, the, the issue is the, your conclusion. You know, you okay. have data. Well, I think he means that the underlying model, to check the validity of the underlying model, yeah, the correct, correct. correctness of the calculations yeah. themselves. Yeah. Your conclusion should be correct. The, the calculations are always correct. Uh, can we redesign a, a model at start? I mean, I mean, with uh, four, I mean, um, points. I mean, and then add some points based on this, on the on the, the results of the model. I mean, to t to make a, a first model with smallest with smallest amount of uh, experiments, and then we add some points uh, if in case we see that uh, it's not so. Uh, what you? What you? <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> are you a graduate here? Uh, PhD candidate. In, in what field? Uh, food and techniques. And you're uh, taking a course in the design of experiment? Uh, I, have, I did some modeling. Uh, uh, no, I think that uh, you're asking an excellent question. For example, in what... These guys, no, I think. It's huh? These guys, coming from the food... No, no. This guy. Coming from the food... Uh, Technology because they have no, no chance of having a knowledge driven model. Right, right, right. Exactly. exactly. That's so the point. Are not the no, I mean, the knowledge driven model. Don't uh, get offended by that. Knowledge driven model, but rather data driven uh, model. Uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the DAO process so you can understand if, if uh, uh, hopefully, I won't keep all the others. In the DAO process, the, the concept was that it was a test. It was test of the design dynamic experiments. They did not do experiments in the real plant. But for a plant that was making a certain polymer, which was indeed in the Netherlands, of specialty uh, polymer, they had developed a knowledge-driven model, a very detailed knowledge-driven model. And of course, they didn't give me that. They didn't tell me anything. So they told me that it's a polymerization, and you have to feed in that much monomer. And the amount of monomer that you feed should be constant because that corresponds to the amount of polymer you make. The duration of the bath, it was one hour. I don't know what it was, I mean, it was one unit. I don't know if it was one day or three days, right? And then they said that the product has two quality characteristics at the end. The, unreact the amount of unreacting monomers should be less than 1%. I don't know what was 1% or 1 ppm. They all made them dimensionless on this for proprietary reasons, which I didn't care. And then there should be, there is a quality parameter of the product that should be less than 1%. Then they gave me three operating conditions. Temperature was constant with time, and the monomer was up and then flat. Monomer feeding profile. One of the operations was making good product. The other two were not making good product. Say go. And we, we played what I call a chess game, so to speak, uh, in that it, it, the perception was that this is a real operating unit, it's not just a lab unit. And then I was supposed to design a set of experiments to see whether I can use the bad stack. By the way, they use optimization on the, on the real model themselves. So to some extent, the test was how close I can come to the knowledge driven option. So initially I said, hey, hmm, I want them to do too many experiments. So I minimized the number of experiments and I only varied the temperature and the monomer by 10%. And only tried to reduce the bath time by 6%. So I did some experiments, right? I told them, this is the conditions you should do. They did them. None of them made an acceptable product. I was lucky to say, right? But I did very few because I was sensitive, because I want them to apply it into a real process. I didn't want to tell them to do 100 experiments. I said, you know, uh, we cannot do that in real life. So I made about uh, 10 experiments. They're random. They come back to me. 
the very bit, the, there is an impact on the performance criteria because keep in mind this these runs have to make a sellable product. If, if I change the conditions too much, then I said, oh, forget it, right? So then I develop my first model, and then I use the first model to design the second set of experiments, and we end up reducing by 20%. Now, with the real detailed model, you know how much I reduce it? 25%. Now, of course, if you want to have the maximum optimization, go and develop the model, the detailed model. But developing the detailed model takes a lot of time. Who would like to develop a knowledge-driven model about cooking a leg of lamb in an oven and predicting the quality? Nobody would do that, right? The challenge would be to uh, infer the uh, knowledge-based model from data-driven... Well, that's, that's of course the first. That's of course the The issue, of course, is that how to combine the two extremes, how to combine partial knowledge of what's happening so you don't waste that, right? Because the way I'm doing it, I said, okay, I don't care whether it's a reactor or a bioreactor, this is a thing, I look at it as a black box. How to have a gray box, so you write some material energy balances, you write something, it's not a complete story, and then what type of experiments would you do in order to learn what you do not know? That's, that's, the, open, that's the open question to some extent. Well, I happen to give a reservation at the restaurant, half an hour ago, and uh, you better rush. Okay. Hey, uh, will you take uh, questions uh, through email, uh, Crystal? Absolutely. All right. So, well... Not only that, but uh, the, the time difference of oh, seven hours is advantageous. Right. Sure. Okay, well, uh, let's call it an end. Thank you very much. Again.